Melissa, welcome to the show. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to dive into this conversation with you because, you know, the people that you're helping right now, and specifically it's moms without a mom, uh, and there's obviously different definitions and we're going to get into that, right? So I'm not a mom, I'm a guy, uh, (laughs) but I know what it's like to go through life uh, and go through ups and downs and even the wins when you don't have a mom. And I, and I believe the support you're giving these individuals is life-changing because it is not an easy road to go down. Um, but why don't we start this conversation with who is Melissa today? And then we'll break down how you got there. Sure. So I am a mom without a mom who is a clinical psychologist and a coach for other moms without a mom. Yeah, I love it. So obviously being a clinical psychologist, you, I'm sure you deal with the gamut of different types of clients and all those types of things. Talk a little bit about that journey in your life. Like, why did you choose that road? Because obviously that, that could be daunting for so many people. What made you decide that you wanted to get into this field and, um, and, and obviously continue to pursue it throughout your life? Well, I think it's been part of who I am for my entire life. So I was born into a family of mom and dad, and I was the second daughter of three. And early in life, my older sister was diagnosed with leukemia. Mm -hmm. And back in the 70s, it was almost always terminal. And so, of course, it was. And my early life experiences were shaped by that experience and then the aftermath of being in a household where a child was lost. And so I became the child who made everything easy. Hmm. I was really good at sensing how others were and that just became my role. And I continued to be that as I grew up, I was the friend that anybody could talk to. I was the problem solver, I was the peacemaker and it just became part of who I was. So I knew early on, actually, the first thing I wanted to be was um, a scientist. And then I learned they had to like go to college for like seven years. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I could never do that. Right. I have a similar so, story. I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a kid. And then I realized how much like reading you had to do. And I was like, yeah, forget that. Yeah. Well, the irony is, you know, I wound up choosing a career that had 10 years of college. So, yeah, which is crazy. Right? But um, but then, you know, once I learned that there was such a career as psychology and and becoming a psychologist, that was just my focus. And I went straight through um, and in college realized that I wanted to be a clinical psychologist, which which means um, that I treat individuals with depression and anxiety and marital conflict and emotional distress and things like that. And and so that that was my focus. I, I went straight through college, into graduate school, got my doctorate, residency, all of that. And that was my path. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your character and who you are, right? Obviously I Mm -hmm. consider myself, you know, an empath and I seem to be the person that people are drawn to, to start, like, I'll just be sitting somewhere and somebody literally would just open up about their life and share the things. And, you know, a lot of people would consider it a burden um, Mm -hmm. because you do kind of take on that energy and, and everything else in between. So what do you do? Obviously, look, you serve patients all day, uh, and now, and now you've stretched out even beyond the patients and you're helping right. even more people that are grieving, but you know, what are some things you do for yourself to make sure you're taking care of yourself and your emotions instead of allowing it to attach to you in some way, shape or form? Well, a big part of my education and training involves the process of developing healthy emotional boundaries and maintaining those healthy emotional boundaries is essential when you are in the helping profession. So I'm really good at recognizing what is my emotional experiences versus what is the emotional experiences of others. So I can connect and understand um, very effectively, but I can also step back and notice what's going on internally and, and what I need to do to keep that part of myself comfortable and safe and, and functioning. What are some things people, you know, people that obviously are, are similar to me, right? Not necessarily psychologists mm-hmm. who have the training in order to deal with that, but people who tend to be the person that's the shoulder to cry on at times and yes. all the things in between. Um, what are some things they can do to make sure they're protecting themselves? 
Well, be in tune with your body, right? So when you're noticing yourself getting to that level of distress, then something's getting triggered. You may or may not recognize what that is, but that's when you want to take a step back a little bit and do some of your own self-care, whether that be meditating, just simply taking a deep breath, exercising, journaling, artwork, but be aware and use your body as a barometer. Our body is always giving us signals of whether we're in a place of safety and comfort or whether we're in a, a, a space of distress. And signals of distress include irritability, short temper, agitation, restlessness, anxiety, stomach ache, headache, um, just to name a few. Yeah, I feel like I've <laughs> I feel I've I've experienced all of those things. So I totally I totally understand. And obviously, being able to to acknowledge, hey, where is this coming from, right? Like, is this me and what I'm dealing with? Or is this the things that I've been, you know, bringing into my life from listening to others and trying to help others and trying to solve so many issues, right? And I think that's such a great lesson for people to learn to say, hey, like, yes, you continue to serve people without hurting yourself, right? You need to make sure you take care of yourself first, which is just so key as we kind of navigate life and we're building businesses and we're doing all these things, right? So as we obviously progress through your career and your track record, what made you hone in on moms without a mom? Like, what is that draw to you? Because this is something that obviously it's a very niche market, but mm-hmm. it's also not, right? Like, I think there's so many people that, that deal with it, but what made you drawn to those individuals? Well, I became a mom later in life. So my focus was career um, and I didn't start my family until my mid thirties. And I uh, had several miscarriages prior to my uh, birthing my son. And that pregnancy with my son was medically challenged and I was on bed rest and it was a real challenge. And all of this happened um, over a decade after my mom had died. So I was in my mid twenties when my mother had died uh, quite suddenly. And so I had gone through all of the grieving that I expected to, to go through. You know, I had job changes and marriages and divorces and remarriages and all these things yeah. without my mom. So I, you know, figured I'd done my grieving, right? Not to mention, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist. I know what grieving is, right? Like I, I'm the pro I'm here. Before. I'm the exactly. pro. Exactly. Exactly. And so, but during, you know, the, the, the losses and the pregnancy, the difficult pregnancy, I started to realize, oh, I am really missing something. You know, I really wish I had my mom to talk about because we don't talk, you know, you can't just talk about, you know, intimate body functions with, with all of your friends, right? I mean, sometimes you have a friendship that you could do that with, but, you know, not necessarily. And so once I gave birth to my son, I was expecting to have this period of joy and to feel really good about the process because, you know, again, I'm older in life. I knew who I was as a woman. I felt confident. Um, I taught, you know, uh, human development at the graduate level. I had treated, you know, hundreds of moms in my clinical practice. So, you know, kind of know things. But after he was son, um, he was born, Justin, I... I never felt more incapable in my life. I felt incompetent. I felt unprepared. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Everything was so hard. I knew I was vulnerable for postpartum depression because of some family history stuff and and medical stuff. Mm -hmm. And, And I certainly experienced postpartum depression, but I wasn't expecting the intensity of longing for my mom, for that sense of grief, for what I thought my uh, experience would be like. And so not realizing that there was a cause to all this, I felt badly about myself. I felt like there was something wrong with me. I mean, why why could all these other women do this? And, And I couldn't. And I had all these resources. I had all this background and I couldn't do it. I was struggling so bad. And it was really one of the most difficult times of my life. Um, well, I continue to work, um, and seeing other moms and, and over the next several years, I started noticing patterns. I started recognizing some similarities amongst other women who like me didn't have a loving mother by their side. 
And so I started thinking about that. I started thinking, you know, I, I think there's something to this. I think there is something unique about those of us that don't have our mom with us in this process. And so being the psych nerd that I am, I did some research and you know what I found? Not a lot. Yeah. There isn't a lot out there, despite the fact that, like you said, there are millions of mothers out there who are mothering without their mom. And so I made the decision about a year ago to, to change that. So I started doing my, my own research and I made it a mission of mine to provide information and support to moms that also like me don't have a mom. And that's why I started my coaching program. No, I love it. And and it's so true. And, and number one, there's so many, so many things to take away from what you just said, right? Like number one is just because you're the expert doesn't mean you don't need help. Um, I think that that's such a big thing in, in the coaching space and the entrepreneur space in the, you know, whatever space. And, and it's so funny because obviously people come to me and, and they say, Hey, I want help with my brand and I want to help with my business and I want to help with my podcast. And I go to people and I go, Hey, I want help with my business and I want help with my brand and I want help with my podcast. And I think that's such a lesson for so many people to learn, even if they're not dealing with being a mom without a mom right now, that's so big uh, to go, Hey, I, I acknowledge that something's off here. Like, what can I do to kind of make a shift? And then this could become your purpose. Like, I think that there's so much joy in the understanding that our purpose can be bred from what we feel is a rock bottom moment. And I think a lot of times that is the case, right? To yes. have all, I mean, obviously you've been through so much in your life, right? Losing your mom at a young age and losing your sister at an even younger age and all these things. And then, you know, and, and now this, right? Like now I, I thought this would be the most joyous moment, but it became a, a massive struggle. Now, as you kind of opened up the idea of like, Hey, let me be the coach to the moms without a mom. I want you to define, you know, what that means. Like, I think some people might be hearing this and going, Oh, well, my mom's still alive, but I think yes. that there's so much more to that. Talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So I define a mom at, without a mom as any mother who doesn't have the support and guidance of a loving mom by her side. So that includes like, like myself, moms who, their mothers have passed away, but also moms who have a conflictual or toxic relationship with their mother or in an emotional estrangement. And so if it is unhealthy and your mother isn't there for you, then you are a mom without a mom. And also moms who don't live in the same place in the planet as their mother. So they may have a good relationship, but they still don't have their mother as a go-to person. They can't just call them up and say, hey, help me out. So examples of that would be military moms or moms that are either in mission or um, international schools. Yeah. What Have you run into anybody that you know, at a, at a young age was either in the foster care system or somebody who was adopted and they may have had a mom in that stance, but they might be grieving through the process of not having their birth mother. Have you seen any of that? Yes, absolutely. And, and that is, you know, a whole nother set of experiences because there's a sense of, of guilt, you know, do I have this wonderful thing in my life, but yet there's still something missing. Um, yeah. And so we see, you know, that, that adds another layer of complexity to it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing in these coaching groups to help mm -hmm. individuals through this, because obviously, look, it's a process, right? Like you're, yes. you're not going to show up to one session. You're not going to show up to one group and, and be like, oh, I, I feel better now. There, there has to be a process. What have you seen some of these women and yourself kind of mm -hmm. work through as you've been able to heal? So there are three main areas that I focus on. First is, is grief, right? Whether it be the loss of your mom or it be the loss of what you thought you would have when you became a mother. Mm. Um, so it isn't necessarily grieving the person, but it's grieving the idea of having that support. That's and that know. can and that can come out in all different kinds of ways and in unexpected ways. So, you know, you're at your child's musical, right? And then all of a sudden you have this pang of pain, you know, out of the blue. So what do you do with that? So recognizing and then uh, working through the grief is the one area. Secondly, is building a community. Because as I said earlier, 
for many women, moms function as a go-to person. And we don't have a mom as a go-to person if you're a mom without a mom. And so we need to fill in those gaps, those areas that she would provide wisdom, assistance, support, and so forth. Um, so I help identify those areas and build those. And then the third is mom identity. And so basically, how do you see yourself as a mom? And so if you didn't have a mom growing up or you had a mom who was not a good mom, mm. how do you define yourself as a mom? And even if you had a wonderful mom and she's still alive, but she's not with you, you don't have that mirroring. You don't have that kind of back and forth interplay. And so building that mom identity um, is the, the third piece that can be difficult or problematic that we that we work through. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about filling those holes that you talked about in the second the second step. What is mm -hmm. what does that really mean? Like, how how can people do that? Because I look at it like, OK, obviously say somebody loses their mom, right? Physically, they're not on this planet anymore. And they feel like there's a massive hole there. Mm -hmm. What can they do to begin to fill that hole? Okay. So I talk about the four women that all moms without a mom should have in her mom community. So the first one is the wise woman. And any of these four people can be, you know, friends, family, professionals. Um, so, but you need four you need to fill all four of these categories. So the wise woman, this is the woman that knows things. And if she doesn't know it, she knows how to find it out. And she's very generous with her information. For me, my son's teachers in his early learning center filled a lot of the, those roles for me. They, you know, they provided me with all kinds of information. The second is the emotional supporter. So this is a person who's really good at listening. She doesn't try to cheer you up and she doesn't give you advice. She just lets you be where you are. Mm. The third person is what I call the go-getter. So this one is really good at getting things done. So she can help with different chores and um, do things. And they have tons of energy and are so generous in just helping out. And then the fourth person I call the late night talker. So this is the person that is available at off times. Um, and nowadays... We can see that often in social media and through the digital connections. Um, so it's unrealistic, Justin, to see one person filling all four of those needs. Now, moms sometimes can simply because of the nature of that relationship, the long term shared history and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, for example, I'm a pretty good emotional supporter and a wise woman now at this point in my life. Um, I'm not a good go-getter. Oh my goodness. I still have laundry and this isn't a joke in my dryer from last week, right? I'm just <laughs> not so, good at by it. By the way, if I didn't live with three other people, I'd still have laundry in the, the dryer too from last week. I, yeah. I feel you. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to be that person that someone says I need help and I'd run right over and do it, but but that's not where my energy is. That's I'm not good at that, right? So we right. need to be able to recognize who in our life um, can fit those different roles and, and then go ahead and, and seek that out. Um, and when we're in crisis, isn't the time to do that. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah. So. And, and that's so crazy. And, and, it, and it's funny to think about how, you know, as you're saying these things, I'm like, wow, like a mom has to fill so many roles. Yes. Like, like the idea of, especially young children and even, even adult children. Like, I think the one thing I was thinking too, as you were talking, I'm like, there have to be women who have, a, you know, kids that are in their forties. Right. And there's, you're still a parent. Like there's mm -hmm. still that, like, I have to be there. I have to support. I have to, the role of mom never ends. And so right. I'm sure there's so many women that can learn from this. I also love your four people. It sounds so similar to my five people in your life, which in the community tomorrow we'll dive into, but right. there's it, like so many important things to take away there um, to have that support system, especially as you're going through it. But, but I think the big takeaway for me there was like, a mom fills so many roles and the acknowledgement of that is, is key, mm -hmm. uh, which might add to the grief at first to be like, wow, I've lost all these things, but the understanding of like, Hey, let me fill them with other, with other individuals. I think that's, that's super key. So I, I love, I love all that. And I think that's such a great place to start for individuals. Um, so I want to ask you something that I ask every single person on this show. It's a two part question. So the first part of the question is what is your definition of success? The second part is what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? And I'm going to be a little bit more specific with you. And I'm going to say, how do you define your success as a mom without a mom? 
And what are three things you do every single day to support that continued success in your life? Okay. My success as a mom without a mom is that both myself and my children are alive. <laughs> mm, that's huge. So, that's so good. Exactly. We are alive and doing the best that we can. My kids know that they are loved and they feel that love. And I can take moments in my day and truly enjoy being their mother. And that's so important. So um, that's my definition of success, that they're alive, they feel loved, and I can have moments where I'm enjoying that process. And so three things that that I do every single day to make sure, first and foremost, um, I communicate my love with, with my kids every single day, both through words as well as actions. You know, in our house, we, we do this thing where we say, I love you. And then they'll say, I love you more. And then I love you most, right? And then the last one will say impossible, right? You know, it's just <laughs> this back and forth fun thing that we do. Love it. So, so I express love. Second is that I'm doing check-ins all the time. Where am I? What do I need to do to be okay? Is my stress level really high? If so, let me go do one of the things that I do to relax myself, meditate, exercise, so forth. And the third is to have some fun. Because without enjoying each other, without having fun, then it becomes really easy to feel discouraged and alone and all those negative things that go along with it. And that then gets in the way of being the mom I want to be. Yeah. So one thing I hear from you throughout this conversation is that it takes a lot of self-awareness through this process. Mm-hmm. I've met many people, I won't name them, but I've met many people in my life who lack self-awareness, who lack the idea of, oh, hey, I need to make a change here or lack the ability to see certain things. What are things people can do? And this might be a psychology question more than anything else. What are some things people can do to become more self-aware or at least check themselves um, or daily habits to go, okay, I need to see where I'm at and be more aware of, of who I am. Um, I, I think one of the, the easiest way is to look at what is your locus of control. And so that is a psych term, but locus of control, locus of control is how do I see the world, right? Is, are things happening to me? So it, you know, is everything bad, the responsibility of somebody else or the world out there? Or do I have the ability to control what I'm experiencing? So if you are a person where things just always feel like they're happening to you or other bad things, you know, people in your life are bad and treating you harshly, right? If there's always this sense of um, victimhood, that is a good indicator that your locus of control is probably external primarily. And therefore um, you can be this feather in the wind right? It was blown all over the place. And so I would encourage to turn that around a little bit, right? And start looking at what is it that, that I have controlled, not the bad people, not what other people should be doing different, but what is it that I can be doing to change my experience of what they are doing? Mm. So, you know, I love that. I love that. I think that's so key. And I think that's a huge takeaway for every single person. Um, mm-hmm. because, uh, it's so, like the idea that life is happening to me. We, I talk about that all the time, right? Like life, life is happening for me, not to me. Exactly. And, and it's really that self-awareness game, the understanding that, yeah, bad things are always going to happen, but how am I reacting to that? And how can I make it in my favor in some way, shape or form by how I react to it? I think that's, I think that's key. So before we get to how people get a hold of you, I want to ask you a question that I've, I've recently put back into the show. Uh, yeah. uh, so the question is at the end of your life, if you could only be remembered for one sentence, what would that sentence be? She loved deeply. Mm, that's powerful. And, and you see that in your work and uh, all the things you're doing above and beyond for so many individuals who are struggling with being a mom without a mom. I, I love that that's your, your sentence. I think that's super key. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up with uh, uh, restart pause. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with the same question that I, I, I end every single episode with before we get there. How do people get a hold of you? If somebody's struggling with this, how can they work with you? What's all the good stuff? So they can find me on my website, which is momswithoutamom.com. I'm on Instagram at momswithoutamom, um, TikTok at momswithoutamom, Facebook, you know, you know, all the places. 
And if anybody is looking for support and just wants to connect or has a question and, and isn't sure what they're needing, I offer all of um, your listeners a free complimentary coaching call with me. So um, they can find that at my website. Awesome. So it's momswithoutamom.com? Yes. Awesome. So they go there, fill out the form. They get a complimentary phone call. I love that. That's, that's absolutely great stuff. So like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. Since the show is called The Growth Now Movement, that question is, in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? I think becoming a mom and finding my confidence and power within becoming a mom and knowing that I am a great mom, even though I don't have my mom with me. Mm, I, I love that. And, and, and embracing the imperfections that we, that we all have, right? Like I think, yes. I think sometimes we're our toughest critic uh, mm -hmm. and there's so many lessons in this as we go through, like understanding the importance of support and understanding of forgiving ourselves and self-awareness. Like there's so many great life lessons for even people who aren't struggling with, right. with what you are an expert in, because just the self-awareness and the idea of like, Hey, I'm not perfect. And that's okay. Like forgiving yourself and all the things in between yes. this conversation has been absolutely phenomenal. Melissa, I look forward to, you know, continuing our friendship and, and doing all the fun things in between, but thank you so much for doing what you do and pouring into the individuals that need it. It's, it's so needed. I'm so glad you saw that niche. Uh, and uh, just thank you for coming on. Oh, it is my pleasure, Justin. Thank you so much.